real pleasure for me to be with you here today and to ask you some questions about your experience, mm -hmm. your ideas, um, some of the influences on your work. Mm -hmm. As you know, uh, there is hardly a course taught on anything urban uh, where your name hasn't become quite an important item, especially since the image of the city. Today, I'd like to ask you about your own personal background, your education, the people who influenced you early in life, and then to move on to a discussion of the dream and reality of urban planning as you experienced it. Well, so first, if you would introduce yourself. Right. Uh, my name is Kevin Lee. I brought up in Chicago, on the north side of Chicago. Come from a third, I'm third generation Irish. Uh, my grandparents came over during and after the family in Ireland. And um, so it was a middle class family that I come from where Essentially, they had been, you know, struggling to find their feet and working their way up. Uh, on my father's side, for example, they had a very much boom and bust life where they, um, at one time, there were times when they were living on South Michigan Boulevard, which at that time was one of the fancy areas of Chicago, and the times in which they lived in the county jail because they had no other place to live, and he knew the, knew the jail keeper. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was a hard struggle, but by the time I come along, it was a fairly well-established middle-class family living on the north side, right next to the lake, which is one of the things I remember, the Great Lake Michigan that we swam in in the summer and walked along in the, uh, the rest of the year. Um, started out in a uh, parish school, in a Catholic school, and um, left because my mother felt that I wasn't getting a good um, education there and I must say I always um, think what a lot of courage she had. She was a good Catholic and every time that uh, I went to confession, uh, if you understand, yes. I was always asked uh, why wasn't I in the Catholic school and she was feeling that pressure all the time and yet um, she she decided for herself that she ought to send me to a different kind of school. So Courageous lady. Yeah. I went to a school called Francis Parker then which is probably the main influence in terms of education much more than college mm -hmm. it was a progressive school it was one of the first schools begun by a man named francis parker who oh. came from the from the east by the way he's a quincy man he was the superintendent of schools in quincy massachusetts mm -hmm. and was a disciple of john dewey uh -huh. and was one of the first progressive schools in the country so these would be the years what years box well this is what i would have i graduated from high school in 1935, so it would have been in the late 20s and the 30s during the Depression. I see. And uh, what I mostly remember are first some great teachers and a school which encouraged you to be active and to do things and, and so on. And then also all around the Depression, I mean, those tremendous years in this country when the, um, the, the bread lines were forming and there was tremendous uh, political upheaval a lot of us were being swept up into the questions of political and social and political questions. It's uh, walking on picket lines and so on. And In your milieu, it would have years. been very much a kind of socialist gospel, or would it have been? Yeah, this, this was socialist, uh, mm -hmm. mostly, um, working with the labor unions and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, not through the family, with the family being rather respectable, but mm -hmm. uh, um, with other kids. And I think you know, that was one of the great times of my life, was that those high school years during the Depression, working both in a great school and in a tremendous ferment around the world outside. Um, the Spanish Civil War, for example, was probably the first real, the great political influence of my life. Uh, uh -huh. uh, and uh, remember being involved in that, emotionally, that is. So that whole anarchist philosophy of self uh, well it wasn't just anarchism it was also as you know both the anarchists and the, and the communists were were very active in spain yes. so we were as kids at that time very much on the outside but still wrapped up in the whole questions of socialism communism the communist party in the united states and, uh -huh. and so on and then after that i went to uh, i went to yale because i wanted to study architecture the reason i got interested in architecture was a very fine seventh grade teacher who set me to studying Egyptian architecture and from that wow. um, I, it just went on. <clears throat> I went to Yale because um, knowing nothing about where to go I asked 
the only man I knew was an architect in Chicago, a man named uh, Holliver, who was one of the big firms in Chicago. Where'd he go? And he said, young man, you should go to Yale. And the reason he said go to Yale was because it was the last Beaux-Arts school in the country. It was the most conservative and backward architectural school in the country at that time. <laughs> so, so I went there and took a couple of courses and got disgusted and left. And I dropped out of Yale and um, happened to run across in the library a little booklet by Frank Lloyd Wright. I wondered about that. And whether he uh, had... so I said, that's where I want to go, and I went with him. Oh. And I spent a year and a half with Frank Lloyd Wright, which is the other great influence in my life, uh, really. That, uh, Why was it that he was so influential? Was it because he had a sort of social philosophy as well as architectural? No, difference? he was a great man, that's all. I mean, he, was a, he, was, he just radiated the, the kind of uh, confidence and brilliance in interest and form and so on. You know, his social philosophy actually was rather backward, you know. I wouldn't call it exactly reactionary, but he looked backward in a sense to craft. Mm. He comes out of the arts and crafts movement, you know. Mm -hmm. And although he talks a lot about the machine, he really had a rather backward look of society. Romantic about rural yeah, values about and so on. rural life and, and craftsmanship and so on. But he was very active. An individualistic so. society. Uh -huh. uh, and but uh, what a tremendous you know influence he, he made me see the world for the first time he actually look at things and to live in the midst of that creative ferment was a wonderful experience that must um, be, yeah. so uh, so I, I think of that as being other great influence in my life and then <clears throat> I left Frank Lloyd Wright because I felt one was swallowed up in a place like that you became only a small Mr. Wright, if you stay. Uh, and I, I remember that when I decided to leave, he was very angry with me. He cursed me up and down. It was oh the my. most uh, uh, wonderful bit of cursing that I've ever <laughs> covered in my life. It was really poetic. But I left anyway. Can you give us an example of the way he cursed? I can't remember, and it probably shouldn't be out. <laughs> <All right. laughs> anyway, but, but it was, uh, he, ha he had a wonderful tongue. You know, he comes from a preacher's family, a Welsh preaching family. And his, his gift of words in speaking about architecture or anything was tremendous. Uh -huh. So then I, I decided I should, needed some engineering. I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic as a special student and studied uh, civil engineering, structural engineering, and so on. But most, but got rather bored with that and then went over and worked with a biologist named Bray, who was another great teacher. Uh -huh. uh, an older man, a um, marvelous teacher who not only was teaching about biology and living things, but about its connection with you know, whole social life. And Ecology. So. Well, more than that, he'd been a, he was, he was a very interesting guy. He'd been a, an apprentice in England, had run away to this country, worked for a while, I think as a carpenter, and then went on the bum, and he was for a long time a railroad bum, and then he joined the, the Wobblies, you know, the Industrial Workers of the World, was an organizer, a union organizer all with no education of his own, but teaching, learning on his own, and then finally uh, got interested in science, taught himself biology, and became a college professor with no degrees at all. He's a very fascinating wow. man, and uh, that was another great influence. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but reminiscent of Ian McCarg, in a way. I um, suppose I don't know Ian that well, you know, huh? but this, this was... From a, his story, it sounds yeah, like he did yeah, some, picked yeah, it up on the way, and yeah, he speaks possible. more convincingly than yeah. people from the... Yeah. Sure. Expertly. Yeah. Great. So after your civil engineering, then uh, biology. To, then after that, I went and worked for an, with an architect for a while in Chicago, Paul Schweiker. I uh, was drafted. Spent six years in World War II, oh. in the com combat engineers. And then, coming out of on the GI Bill, I finally came to MIT to get some work in city planning, which had long been a sort of dream. Mm -hmm. And spent uh, what a year here and got a bachelor's degree. I'm one of the few people in the world who have a bachelor's degree in city planning. It's a special degree. And uh, uh, it's, quite a it's gone now. It isn't given anymore. Uh -huh. But uh, anyway, I, after getting that, then I went to work in North Carolina for a year and then finally came back here to teach. So oh, I see. I've been uh, teaching at MIT since, what, 1948, I guess, something like that. Uh -huh. um, 20, 30 years. So I can see two main influences in a way, one mm. social, one architectural. Mm -hmm. uh, did MIT provide for you the kind of opportunity 
you were seeking to, to blend those two mm. into a teaching or mm. research program? Uh, well, not really, to be honest with no. you. I don't think so. No, no, I think uh, uh, MIT to me has always been, interestingly enough, a very stimulating place, but also a rather hostile place. And um, always been a place where you felt you weren't quite part of the society, but were, had different kinds of aims. And that? yet, well, the emphasis on technology, on uh, precision, on uh, uh, sometimes rather inhuman ways of looking at uh, questions was one that I always had a hard time with. But on the other hand, there were brilliant people here and good students coming. And uh, I guess I, I found myself, for the most part, learning more from the students than I did from the rest of the faculty. I wondered about that. Yeah, you did uh, mention some fellow workers. Yeah, the yeah they're mostly uh, students. There were, there were some exceptions, of course, people like Jerry Kepish. Who, Can you tell me about your relation with him? Well, he's, field? he's a painter and a great man and tremendously broad in the sense that he comes out of the whole socialist tradition in, in Europe and uh, connects his art with social questions uh, and was a great eye-opener to me in a way, you know, he broadened many aspects of what I had to see. And we worked together on some early research on the image of the city and it, that was, a, mm. for me, a great beginning. Yes, because uh, I get the yeah. feeling from you that the yeah. architecture, in a way, is, is a form of social involvement. Sure. That with yeah. good design, you can yeah. make a better society. Well, I don't know about that. Or happy people. I, yeah, I think you can, you can with, good, with a good environment, you have a better chance of, of being more fulfilled people, possibly, more meaningful lives. But I don't think that by the physical environment alone you can change society. I don't believe that. No. But it has to be connected. I think always, when you're working on such issues, you have to be connected with the social questions. And okay. it's very hard to make that connection in this country. Um, oh. Well, because the whole form of the profession is essentially to work for large public agencies which may or may not be connected with the people whom they're serving. And it's, you know, it's very hard to make those connections across the institutional grain. Have it's you not ever easy. tried to do that? Yeah, we've tried to do it uh, a number of times. Uh, recently, for instance, we were working for the tenants of Columbia Point. I don't know if you know Columbia Point in Boston. It's a pruitt Igo. It's the worst public or maybe one of the two worst public housing projects in the, in the city. And uh, the question of rehabilitating it, and we were working with the tenants there and yet had tremendous troubles with the, with the housing authority. Finally, we were pushed off the job because in a sense we were making trouble. But that's, that's, an, that's not an unusual story, that's a familiar story. You see it inevitable that the planner will be less and less able to be on the tenant side, as it were. No, no, I don't. I don't think it's in first place. It isn't inevitable. In second place, it isn't less and less so. I think mm -hmm. uh, maybe there are more chances now of finding cracks in the whole system, working around really? on the other side. Yeah. You're optimistic about that. Yeah, in the long run. Yes. In the long run. Long run, <laughs> run optimist. It's yeah. a safe position to be in. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, I often wondered about that because yeah. some tenants can be more articulate about their design needs yeah. and so forth, yeah. and the internal social hierarchy mm -hmm. within the tenants mm -hmm. uh, population may yeah. in fact be more inimical to the poor interests than the outsider sure. as a whole. But but certainly the idea of working with the people who live in a place. Uh -huh is one that has at least become intellectually respectable now, which was hardly thought of earlier, and therefore means um, that you've got a chance. Although you're, you're working against the grain, you do have a chance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done earlier work where, in the sense, we weren't even aware of what we were doing to people. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Like this government center thing that I could tell you yeah. about. And, I'd yeah. like to hear about one story. Yeah. You're great at yeah. telling stories. No, know? I like tell it. Tell me a story mm -hmm. of one project that you well, were involved I, with, which illustrates some of the things we were talking about. I thought I might tell you about the, the government center project, which we were involved with, but as any of those big projects, it doesn't mean that we did it or that we were the only professionals. We were part of a long stream of events. Yeah. And, um, well, maybe I could show a few slides, Please. and then yeah, that if we could turn on the first us. slide, then I could... Um, if that's in focus, I can't tell from the monitor, but... Uh, that's the map of the center of the city of Boston. Um, and in the... Uh, you can perhaps see the common there with the wooded, the wooded areas. 
to the right of that is, is really the heart of the city, and to the right again, you'll see the old wharves again in the Boston Harbor. Now, that's actually the historic center of the city. The, the water originally came in farther, and there was a town cove there, mm -hmm. which is the original marketplace where food and foodstuffs were landed for the Bostonians. And then, uh, in a sense, that was the commercial center of the town. Uh, before Fennel Hall existed, or long before Quincy Market, there were markets there. Um, then, as as development went on, first Fennel Hall gets built, and it, you know it's typical that it was a hall built for political assemblies and so on meetings, public meetings, but the ground floor was reserved for uh, merchants, for meat dwellers, uh, meat uh, sellers, and so on. So that that mix of commerce and public life was comes right from the beginning. But that, that's a long development from Fennel Hall to the building of the Quincy Markets, where I'm going to show you the long uh, stone and brick buildings that are now rehabilitated, and which indeed in their time were one of the first redevelopment projects. Uh, that was about 18, 1830, I guess, something like that, when the man who was the mayor of Boston, uh, using his own capital, but the public power of condemnation, cleared a lot of small buildings and built these market sheds. And so that was the, the center of the uh, market trade. Now, then, as always happens in, in American cities, the center began gradually to move, especially toward upper classes. And that's a, typical that the center of commerce moves toward the wealthy location. And the wealthy were locating out in Back Bay, which you can see perhaps those long uh, <clears throat> and farther out. The center has been migrating in Boston that way, which is down to the left corner of the slide, all along. Uh, when we came into the picture, which is in the late 50s, um, that end of town was the decaying end of town. Buildings were empty, um, and maybe I can show you another uh, slide. This is about 1957, probably. You can see right in the middle of the picture is Fennel Hall, which is the old uh, Independence Hall where the public meetings, many of the early meetings of the Revolution were held. Then the long buildings to the left going the upper left or Quincy Market. And uh, a public building in the center flanked by two private buildings that were owned by the mayor Quincy. That's where he made his profit, by the way. He, really? Yeah, he, he used his own capital and gave the center building to the city, but retained the outside buildings, and he made his money on that. It's a typical redevelopment uh, caper that he was involved yeah, in. Under the no. Then in the uh, docks, right by uh, Fennel Hall is Dock Square which is, was the original town landing. That's where the water came. Slightly to the right of that is Scully Square, which was at one time the 100% corner in Boston, the big department stores. Now they had moved out of the picture, and this was mostly abandoned. Uh, when we got there, it was an area that was primarily uh, a sort of a, uh, a way for politicians because it connected the state house on one end and the county courthouses, the, the county courthouses and the federal courts below, and therefore there was a great deal of movement of lawyers and politicians on one side. Mm -hmm. But most of the square was given over that time to, uh, to the entertainment district, to the red light district. It was where the sailors went. Uh, and that also incidentally comes from a long history because when Boston was first founded, uh, Beacon Hill had two sides to it, as it still does today, if you maybe mm -hmm. if you know the city. It had a good side, so-called, the south side, which meant where the well-to-do people lived, and the back side is where the poor lived. And that was typically where the my casual laborers and the sailors and the prostitutes lived. Mm -hmm. That whole uh, set of activities had gradually shifted down till it was in Scully Square. Uh -huh. And uh, that's where the old Howard was, actually a, a theater which is just at the very lower edge of this uh, slide was a famous uh, burlesque theater, which used to be the, the used to be the pride of any student in Boston that they went to the old Howard uh, when they first got here. Mm -hmm. Interesting also because really it was a fine theater which had been, uh, was one of the first opera houses in the United States. And again, I don't know whether I want to go into the, the, the side story, but the reason it got built was because of a religious group called the Millerites, who about 1840 or something like that believed that the world was coming to the end, and they knew the date. They knew the year and the, and the date it was going to happen. Mm 
and what they wanted to do was to all be able to meet together and to be praying when they were lifted up to heaven when the world was over but they didn't have an, quite enough cash to do it so a, a local capitalist said he would get a site for them and would uh, would give them some of the capital necessary to build this this assembly hall if they would agree that he could have whatever was left of it you know after the world was over and of course to them that was a steal because who would want a building after the world was finished so they stayed and prayed for several days but it never happened and he took over the building and that was the old howard well the old howard was a a fine but that was part of that focus of, of uh, entertainment activities bars and so on mm -hmm. this in other words was sort of the marginal end of boston mm -hmm. And it was at a time when Boston was quite stagnant. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole operation that we were involved in redevelopment began actually when a man on the staff of the planning board, who, I'm sorry his name I forget, but, but uh, thought to himself, how can we reverse any of this change that's going on? I know how. There's a new federal building about to be built near Copley Square. Mm -hmm. It ought to be built here, and that would spark a whole thing. They did original plan which essentially wiped out all of that area, saved Fannel Hall because that was sacred to the revolution but took the Quincy markets and all of it. Uh, we were then called in by this planning board and that was part of a firm called Adams, Howard and Greeley. And maybe I've got a plan that we produced that shows the beginning of it. Uh, just to orient you again, if you can see at the right end of the slide are the long Quincy markets. Mm -hmm. And just to the left of it is the Fennel Hall. And then the new buildings are shown in white. Uh, there was a new square to be built, a new city hall, a new federal building, office buildings, and so on. Essentially, the, the basic structure of what's there today, this is about 1960, something like that, or early 60s. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to tell you about that was that the, many of the ideas here, the structure, were essentially our ideas, but I'd like to show you how to get, they get changed. Mm -hmm and also to indicate some of the social impact of it, that um, as far as the entertainment activities went, it essentially had no great difficulty. They simply shifted to what is now known as the combat zone, which is another. It's those kind of activities in the city which are always getting pushed on, you know, uh, move on to the next place. The people, and, and we thought about that, and we thought about the problem of relocating the merchants, but the it was typical at the time, I think. The group we never thought about were the, um, were essentially the, bu the bums, the Bowery, the, the alcoholics, who also the drifters who lived in rooming houses around there. Mm -hmm. And the result of our plan was that those people got shifted to another part of the city, uh, you know, really brutally uprooted. And uh, since we were never aware of it, I mean, that's one of the mm -hmm. social, and it, 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 an example, I think, that that might happen today, very easily happen today, but it wouldn't happen without protest or notice mm -hmm. or somebody being aware of it. Nobody ever paid any attention to that. In those days. And, mm -hmm. and um, nobody ever criticized us for it that I know mm -hmm. of. Uh, they had no power, never spoke up. Mm -hmm. and it's as though it never happened, and yet, you know, you look back and you yeah. think. Um, but essentially, this, this was an effort to stabilize the Boston Center that was changing and to reuse a lot of the old buildings. Uh, well, for instance, we saved the Quincy Markets, which were about to be torn down, over the op opposition, I might say, of a number of the Irish politicians who said, uh, uh, well, I remember one time when the, we were making a presentation to the state, uh, the state representatives on this project, and after it was over, one of the men came up to me and he said, uh, your name is Lynch, isn't it? I said, yes, sir. And he said, Irish, I expect. And I said, yes, sir. What do you want to save all those damn Yankee buildings for? Yeah. And yeah. what they really wanted to do was to wipe out the memory of, yes. you know, what it had been. Yes. So there was opposition to that. Now those buildings have been saved. The, the government center is built. The new city hall is built and so on. But maybe I can show you some of the, uh, well, that's another drawing of the uh, perspective of the thing as we showed it with the city hall in the center. and the courts, courts, and so on. Mm -hmm. The Quincy Hall and Fannel Hall down at the bottom. But there were certain main ideas we had, such as there ought to be a square there. There should be a connection from that area to the sea under the expressway. Mm 
and that the old market should be saved and the so-called Blackstone block should be saved, which is the oldest block in Boston. Those things all happen, but is hap what always happens, everything gets changed. Uh, this is the, um, the square, more or less as it is today. The, the next set of planners, after we worked on it, uh, was I.M. Pei. Can I just ask, yeah. on what yeah. terms were you hired? Was it for a specific period? Yeah, we were, hired, we were hired by the planning board yeah. to make a general plan. Within a certain time? Frame? Within a certain time, yeah, yeah, and we did so. Uh, then after that, that was done and uh, a general report was published on it, then there were some important political things that happened. Uh, Mayor Collins was elected, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, the one that pushed all the redevelopment in Boston. Mm -hmm. And he brought on Ed Logue, who was the famous uh, 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 director of the Boston Redevelopment Authority that they wiped out the planning board, consolidated the powers of the redevelopment authority, and they chose to visit only a paper plan. They chose to work on this first because it seemed to be the one most ready to go, and Collins was a, had an election coming up. Mm -hmm. So, but they also felt that they needed some more um, uh, uh, name behind it. We were just a local group, so they brought in I.M. Pei, and essentially the, the, um, the plan pretty much followed ours, except Two things I think that were rather disastrous happened. One, the main thing is that they <coughs> they moved the city hall location down to have a formal axial relation to the Fanel Hall, mm -hmm. and in doing so, they opened up the square, made it much larger, and also they were under pressure from the the architects of the federal building, who were not happy in our plan the fact that half of their building didn't face on the square. That had been deliberate on our part because we knew that the city hall would be a small building relative to the bulk of the federal building, and the federal building was just a set of offices while the city hall was the, was the important symbolic one. Anyway, they pulled it back, and the result, as any Bostonian I think knows, is that you have an enormous square which is very hard to fill. For example, we thought that this would be the place where political demonstrations were held in front of the city hall. Uh, it's now too big for any political demonstration except an overwhelming one. And I think the only time that, if I remember, it's never really been filled was after the hockey team won the, won the championship, and then it really filled up. Now most political demonstrations go to the common instead because they've, they've got a much better setting for it. Well, anyway, it's a square that's too big, and it's full of wind and cold in the winter and so on. But you, what I guess what you see is that the, the ideas you work on get moved down from, from one group to another and are both constraints about them that they may not like, but also they change them, which is they can't help but do. And you see some structural ideas survive and then many other things change. And the result, I think, is that City Hall Square, it's, you know, it's an interesting building, but it's sort of daunting to the ordinary person. The square is too big and you know, a few other things like that happen. Um, now, if you look down to the next part of it, which was the, uh, the Quincy Hall, the Fanel Hall markets, indeed they were saved. And uh, mostly this has had a happy ending, not entirely, I would say, but after a lot of trouble, the read sort of action. Yes. Uh, because in one way, it is the fulfillment of another dream, <laughs> that, uh, sure, that yeah. people of some yeah. kind would be in Yeah, you know, I have, I have very mixed people. feelings about yes. it, because actually the, the this place gives tremendous enjoyment to a lot of people, especially suburban people who come mm -hmm. in and, and see the activity of the mm -hmm. markets. And yet, outside of its own sphere, it's having other effects that you wish you could control, and you can't. Uh, let me look at Incidentally, this is the way, this was a historic function of the markets. This is the late 19th century, and, and it was a wholesale food market of Boston. I remember what is really the tag end of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that, uh, uh, that area now is a pedestrian zone. It's very pleasant, uh, very skillfully done by Ben Thompson's mm -hmm. firm. And uh, even if it, it's a very pleasant place for people, even those who are not buying a great deal. Mm -hmm. Even though they're very fancy shops there, it's easy for a person to come down and get a sandwich and enjoy the people mm -hmm. and the shows and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's it's highly successful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's another view of it. You're seeing now the end of the. Quincy Market in the very background is Fennel Hall and behind it are the county courthouses which is up in the government center square. Uh, behind us now is the expressway which cut this area off from the, from the waterfront 
and our original idea was to open that up. It was blocked by ramps and so on. That's finally succeeded, and I think that it has changed many people's ideas of Boston. They never realized the water was that close to downtown. And uh, 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 this, incidentally, is a historic view of that same Quincy, there's the Quincy Market, Fennel Hall behind it. And that's just after uh, Josiah Quincy made his successful real estate speculation. And the water, you see, was right up there, right to it, now gone. And that's where the inner belt was built, because that was the easiest place to build it. Uh, a later stage in this was that we were later involved in a plan for the waterfront itself, which um, uh, again saved the Quincy Markets, achieved a breakthrough, built a, proposed a park in the center and a cove and so on. Uh, that has been in large part carried out. Uh, again, I don't know how much to stray off the issue, but one of the things that we did there, you can see not only the expressway coming through, but the road that parallel the waterfront, it's called Atlantic Avenue. Uh -huh. It bends in there on the plan. Yes. Originally it ran straight. You can almost see the old track of it going through oh, the buildings. Yes. We bent it back because we felt that would give more space to the waterfront activities that was free of cars. The unexpected consequence of that was that, and I think this is typical of many of the unexpected things that happen in planning, there was in fact a railroad line on that street, a surface railroad line that connected north and south stations. Uh, that was one of the few profitable railroad lines in the United States. They really were making money. So that's all it was, just that short distance. Mm -hmm. To make that change, they had to get the railroad out of there. That took so long that it delayed the redevelopment plan. Uh, that delayed the redevelopment plan so long that many of the uh, uh, new, the old warehouses which were converted into apartments could be occupied with people, and there were people on the spot, even while the big the main redevelopment changes hadn't been made. That meant you had a political constituency on hand mm -hmm. who uh, were concerned about the quality of the place. And they got a bigger park. When there were threats of removing the park, they were there to fight it. Mm -hmm. And by making, in other words, by our making a mistake, which caused the official redevelopment plan to be much delayed, mm -hmm. it gave a chance for a political constituency to get in place which fought for a higher quality place. And it's, you know, it's an interesting reversal. That's very interesting. Uh, this is a bit of the, uh, the park as it now is. This is, I think, it's not a, I don't think, a great design as a park, but the, 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 the people there, the way it's used by mm -hmm. secretaries and so on, coming down to eat for lunch, the mm -hmm. old warehouses rehabilitated, uh, the presence of the water, the fact you can see the airport airplanes rising off mm -hmm. Logan Field and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, it's given, given people access to the water. Mm -hmm. Meantime, let me just show one last one. This is also right next to that park. And here's the marketplace at work again, where the original plan had showed um, public access all along the water. The uh, developers of those apartment buildings uh, wanted to capture private, private water space and cut off public access. And indeed, fought our height limits, went to go up high in order to get all the maximum ground rent. I was a little bit delighted to see that they took many years before they filled those buildings. Uh, they overestimated their market. But in the long run, the public, as the public effect of that has been that where uh, it would have made sense that all of the waterfront was open to the public, that part is already cut off. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, good and bad is always happening in a complicated project uh, of that kind. Uh, and when you, as yeah. you talk, there are several things that keep coming up. One is your, your suspicion of market forces yeah. as, as processes that should mm. shape the city landscape. And uh, the second one is a complaint that, in fact, the planner doesn't have enough power to see a whole design through. Well, Could you comment on... You yeah, know? first one on the market, yeah, obviously I have mixed feelings because uh, there are many ways in which the market <coughs> is a much better guide to what, you know, will fit people's needs than the professional planner. Because in, indeed, as far as dealing with people that have the, the, the money to buy things, or have the income, it tends to respond fairly well to what they want. And if you have no market, as occurs in some countries, there can often be a great divergence between what people want, how they're really acting, and how the plans are made. So that when it's dealing with, um, with that part of the population that has adequate means, it tends to do a good job. What I, uh, what I was complaining about is the fact that <coughs> for those who don't have those means, mm -hmm. it can mean that they're often shut out and that you run a, a standard difficulty. It's very hard to improve the environment mm 
without also giving it to, to the, the middle or upper incomes and taking it away from mm -hmm. And um, uh, we're, we're always struggling with that, always sweating, sweating over that issue. As far as the planner not having enough power, I never said that. No, uh, I'm not uh, discretion enough I don't time, believe in it. Yeah, I don't believe in it, because I think often the planner doesn't know better. So you think this piecemeal, hire uh, who you like sort of process will well, no, I think, the best design? No, I think, for example, in this case, that the, the long uh, development, which has meant it's been bit by bit, mm -hmm. has meant that in general you've gotten a richer product and one more better fitted to what people wanted than it would have been if our original plans had just been carried out just like that, because we left out a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, the reservation I have is for those who don't have the means to express themselves in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, but both the economic market on the one hand and then the other, the whole political process mm -hmm. is tremendously important. The, the park would never have survived if it hadn't been for politics, which was, mm -hmm. uh, so my view of the planner is that he shouldn't make the decisions. Mm -hmm. His job is to propose ideas and so on, but uh, mm -hmm. not to make them. There's several other questions I really yeah. want to ask you. For yeah. example, the image of the city really impressed me and mm -hmm. many people of my generation and so mm -hmm. on. And implicit here was mm -hmm. that it was important to know how people perceived space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and symbols and landmarks mm -hmm. were very, very important. Uh, that's one side. Yeah. The other side is that you feel there should be a democracy of access to housing. Mm -hmm. that there mm -hmm. should, but monuments and landmarks and all that represent mm -hmm. an elitist view of architecture, don't okay. they? Yeah, How I, do you do I don't that? think so. Yeah. You don't? Uh, uh, landmarks, at least in my sense, are the things that people choose to use to, to identify the environment they live in, such that your landmark can be an old door that mm -hmm. you're familiar with. It doesn't have to be a monument in the usual sense of a, of a big structure which is mm -hmm. expensive. Mm -hmm. There's no necessary connection. But the, the connection is... For that Irish politician it represented in his... It was a bad symbol. It was, yeah. A, yeah, it, was a, it was an evil symbol of a, of a past oppression. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I could understand that. And the only argument I could make to him if... Indeed, I guess I would say if, uh, in fact, he represented not only all the people the great majority of the people who would use the place, but indeed uh, the generations to come, then he was right, you ought to tear it down. There's nothing sacred about buildings. What makes them important is what they mean to people. Mm. Right? But I would argue with him because, in fact, he didn't represent. He represented one group. But there's a much larger group living in the metropolitan area that valued those things. And then I was, I guess, so bold as to assert that they were going to value more and more, and that, uh, that uh, therefore, if you tore them down once, you could never put them back. So the way um, you had to exercise. Uh, so I was involved in politics. You were. Yeah, and and, oh. and planning is necessarily politics. You're involved in politics all the time. I don't mm -hmm. see any real distinction. Mm -hmm. You're you're in a political role when you're doing planning. Yeah, I can. But you're only one force that. among many forces. That's all. That. And you believe uh, that the totality <laughs> yeah. of forces eventually. And I guess I uh, just just to to emphasize that I, you know, I think there has been a. Uh, an association in the past of, of the visual quality of the city, uh, great boulevards and so on, with the elite. The idea being, it's only if you had that kind of money and power you could get the great cities. And besides, it's only well-to-do people that appreciate those finer things. And that's a lot of bunk, I think. Certainly the last one. Uh, the the um, people who have much less resources may be more subject and have you know, be more subject to what they see and what the quality of life, the environment is than those who have more. Uh, the interest in historic environment from the studies we've made or nature and so on is, doesn't lessen as you go down in income at all. Uh, it is true that most of the famous work in, in improving the look of a city has been done especially by kings and by great powers. And that's a real problem we have to work with but I don't think it's necessarily so. My, my belief is that you can, uh, and indeed, the image of the city was partly an effort to show that you shouldn't depend on the elite designer and the elite power center, but rather you go to the people who live there and see what they value. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, Yes, but you took three things, identity, structure, and meaning, as mm -hmm. I recall. Mm -hmm. And you said, however, the emphasis in this book will be on identity and mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. We will not deal with this meaning level. Right, Why right. did you do that? for simplicity. <laughs> it's too difficult to work with everything at once. Certainly. And I think I was open about that. Yeah. Not saying the meaning was less important. No. In fact, 
the reverse is true. But you begin with the, with the simpler ideas, uh -huh. and, uh, and since then we have done some work uh -huh. on questions of meaning. Yes. But it's much more complicated. It varies much more between groups. You see, the thing is, you can, you can find that, let's say, um, uh, most people will agree that Fennel Hall is a distinctive building that they remember and know where it is. The identity they agree is what the meaning of it is will be much more variance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and therefore, it's more complicated to study. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but there are people working on it now. Yes. I mean, Donald Appleyard is certainly doing yes. a lot on that, and mm -hmm. many other people. Yes, yes. I didn't mean, I think I was careful to say that it wasn't, not that it was unimportant, but that's as much as I could deal with. Oh, that's I all. you're yeah. avoiding. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to. Yeah. I, I, I see the pit that. in front of me. I'll <laughs> walk around it. Sure. Good Irish one. <laughs> well, the other question I had for you is the future. And this is a question that mm. I think many of my students and my associates yeah. have. Will there be any planning in the future? You know, we used to complain about how little political discretion planners yeah. had over what they did yeah. and so on and so forth. But tell me what your impressions about the future. How much design discretion can a planner have, in a way? Can he be well, creative in his work in the future? Will he be asked to do architectural type work in the future? Will everything be a Well, let's see, let's see. First place, making predictions about the future is risky business. Sure, you know, okay. yes, all right. um, Second place, the general question is easy to answer. Sure, there'll be planning in the future. There always has been planning. You can't build something without planning. It doesn't mean it's done by professionals, obviously. Any building, the most hack work kind of building is planned. Mm -hmm. Any street layout, any, any environment is somebody's intention that they worked yes. out. Right, in that sense, there's always planning. I guess what you're asking is, uh, will professional planners have a role to play? Yes. And I expect, yes, they, um, they're, they're more, there's more and more of that kind of complex planning in fact, what worries me, perhaps, is that um, uh, power tends to be more and more centralized. Economic power and political power, projects are done at larger and larger scales. Yes. This inevitably involves professional planners more and more and tends to distance them from the people that use their yes. places. And thus, I guess, my guess is, yes, um, uh, whoa, with me, there will be more planning in mm -hmm. a professional sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I mean, geographers, for example, it's very obvious now that uh, the urban landscape mm -hmm. is, is a mirror image mm -hmm. of the social and political structures that mm -hmm. have discretion over shaping it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the era of town planning and urban design was a sort of a, a rekindling of hope that neighborhoods could have aesthetic cohesion as well as some social cohesion mm -hmm. and so forth. And we had a lot of interaction at that level. Mm -hmm. But it seems that more and more our cities are like juxtaposed pieces of systems that are planned from remote centers. In other words, you oh, have commercial saying, planning yeah. done. Yeah, so, yeah. well now, what can be done about it? Do you, a, do you think there will be the role for the professional planner at that micro-urban scale? I see scale? what you're asking. That's a different okay. question. Yeah, all yeah. right. Yeah, because if not, there's no yeah. point getting education programs all designed for beautiful generalists who are able to hold things together and so on. If we can't well, find jobs... Well, wait a minute, not, you're jumping, not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, indeed, it's, it's clear there's going to be a large demand for professional planners at more remote and centralized positions. Yes. Okay. And uh, education is needed for that. But to what do kind that of well. Education? Oh, to be human beings, I guess, is the most important thing to try to it, it is possible, you know, even in dealing at the larger scale, to try to structure the problem so you get in touch with the people who are actually using it. You're uh, hopeful about that. Well, it's a technique, yeah. yeah. And it, it can be done, and to some extent you can do it against the grain. Uh, and you, you, have to, you have to teach people to think about that. Mm -hmm. But that isn't the whole answer. The other thing I think you're forgetting is that uh, maybe the most interesting movement in, in planning today is that of neighborhood planning. Mm -hmm. That it's been mostly a reaction against uh, disaster you know, against expressways or redevelopment or what have you, but we're beginning to see a resurgence of the neighborhood in this country. Uh, and it's beginning to move from just a negative, that's veto against things, into uh, positive action and positive planning. And you don't think it's going to be a co-opted gentrification type neighborhood development thing? Well, uh, it depends. Um, uh, some of it certainly is gentrification. A lot of the historic district work is, is actually preparing the way for upper income groups to come in. Nevertheless, that's local. Mind you, keep the thing, two things separate. You can have uh, uh, 
good participation in the sense of users actually controlling the environment they live in, mm -hmm. even though they happen to be well-to-do people. In fact, they've got a better chance of doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily wrong. They ought to have a chance to control their environment, too. Mm -hmm. But there are, indeed, neighborhood organizations in this country that are working with low-income people mm -hmm. and surviving. It's difficult. And there are young planners who are interested in working with them. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the most interesting part of planning in this country today, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, even the historic preservation movement, which I have a lot of suspicions about, mm -hmm. um, is beginning to, you know, to come to terms with this and to wonder whether how they can save a historic area without displacing the people in it and with involved, working with them. Do you think planning schools are orienting themselves toward preparing people for that kind well, of service? Well, some are, and some people. I and mean, planning schools are not monolithic, you know. Yeah. No, no, yeah. but uh, if specialization is moving there as it is in other fields, then you would have more and more specialization, uh, which would have a difficult time dealing with the complexity of the general planning situation in a neighborhood. Yeah, there is probably more specialization, although I think um, in some ways what's happening is that planning is splitting in two pieces. One having to do particularly with the administrative, uh, political, uh, not political, because it's all political, Administr but administrative work mm -hmm. of planning, which is more and more like public policy mm -hmm. action, in which, incidentally, these questions of public participation and the local versus the general are very mm -hmm. much in the forefront, mm -hmm. and, the, and then other pieces moving into physical planning, and which is what I'm interested in. And certainly at MIT, I think, in the group there, they're very much concerned with local action. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the things I, I, I made some remarks about MIT mm -hmm. that I felt in a sense it was a hostile atmosphere and yet in the local group we were working in, in the environmental design group, quite the contrary. I think that the, that's, that's been a very humane place and that's uh -huh. what's interesting about it. Uh -huh. So I think there are schools that are working and, and many young planners that are working in this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, can't, I can't resist asking you the question yeah. of how you feel about the architecture of this place, the MIT. Oh, yeah, I think it's uh, mostly dreadful. Uh, it's, Can you uh, house a humane <laughs> department? Yeah, the trouble is it's very it? confusing, of course. It's a, it's a prying example of the kind of orientation. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, it happens that this particular building is a very wonderful example, Building 9 that we're in, yes. which has a, a circular corridor, mm -hmm. which has no beginning and no ending and has no windows to the outside. And uh, I've had, I had an office in this building once and I had many people stop and ask me, where were they? And this is a very small building. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the numbering system, if you happen to know, the numbering is odd on one part of the circle and even on the other part of the circle. Not sequential at all. And, but that's a... In general, I think the MIT environment <coughs> physically is a, is, a, is a very daunting one and an oppressive one. The one big e exception to that is the main corridor, which is a marvelous street full of people. Yes, it's a street. And, uh, and that, there's a real opportunity there to open uh -huh. that up and, you know, if you could put cafes along it and so on, it uh -huh. would be marvelous because the, the, the kinds of people that are moving back and forth there and the conversations that go on are quite wonderful. I could well yeah. imagine, yeah. yeah. So I guess yeah. it's possible to humanize <coughs> even the 1984 type yeah. spectrum of a possible... Well, it's not 1984, you know. This building is much earlier than that. I this know, wasn't, uh, William Irwin Thompson speaks about this building, yeah. you know, yeah. at the edge yeah. of history. He yeah. compares this and then he takes Esalen, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. says, here's where yeah. we're headed. But, uh, it's but many institutional buildings are of this kind, hospitals oh. and so on. Uh, again, it's an example of centralized planning being remote from the actual users of a place. You see, this was the thing that I wanted to chat with you about, yeah. because that has to do with meaning and yeah. being in a place, what yeah. the architecture itself, how it speaks to you sure. about your power over yeah. your immediate zone of reach. Yeah. And if you're in a maze like this, whether it's a huge hospital, mm -hmm. clinic, mm -hmm. petrochemical plant, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. MIT yeah. School of Architecture, it gives you a feeling of hope, of helplessness mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, that must have something to do with meaning, and well, meaning that is created by the architecture of the place, not mm -hmm. not imposed on it, but impressed on yeah, you no, by no, it. Yeah, no, that's right. It's it's. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there are many influences that come from the physical. For instance, you said it was well accepted that the social and political structure determined the physical environment. That isn't quite true. I don't believe it works both ways. The physical well, environment, the which is a mm -hmm. heritage. You know, you can't easily get rid of, sure. affects the institutional structure, too. Yeah. And um, indeed, it does have um, 
physical environment is like the institutional environment. It has long-term effects because it's relatively stable over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it doesn't mean it's hopeless. There are lots of wonderful things you could do to MIT mm -hmm. to humanize it. In fact, if you, if you were here during the 60s, you would have seen some of that happen. Yes. The change in the main hall, for example, which was originally an empty place, and uh, then how it began to be occupied first by demonstrations, then later by, by um, chamber orchestra and all kinds of things going on. So you really think we're going to be able to put human flesh on those bones we put up in the 60s? Well, sure. I mean, the well, clinics no, and hospitals and... Yes, yeah, I think it's all quite... They can do that. Yeah, the interesting thing about Columbia Point, which I say was, is probably the, one of the worst physical environments I know of, mm -hmm. the most oppressive, is that um, given a control by the tenants who live there, in fact, there are lots of things you can do to humanize it. Uh, sometimes rather dramatic, drastic things, such as we suggested cutting some of those buildings in half and cutting mm -hmm. them down to size. Mm -hmm. um, but changing the outside, changing the inside, humanizing it, allowing local people to make their own mark on the environment, and, and that will change their image of the place, and that's the, that's the key. Yeah. Well, I think that is yeah. a good note on which to end this conversation, well, Kevin. It, give, it gives mm -hmm. hope to people th who are traumatized by mm -hmm. the hugeness of scale mm -hmm. and the seeming uh, impersonality of, of the way things are designed. You give us some hope, we well, keep uh, working on it. <laughs> yeah. I guess. So thank right. you very sure. much for yeah. coming. And thank it was you. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.